Hello, everyone. We wait some minutes to welcome everyone today for this webinar, the first webinar after our holiday break. Please, if you want, in the meantime, you can write in the chat your name and from where are you from, from, from which place, so we can start to know each other in the chat. In the meantime, we welcome the other participants. I see from Romania, Scotland, Lithuania, welcome. So I will start to share my screen presentation. So you can see my slide, right? Perfect. So welcome to this uh, EdenUp webinar, Digital Skills and Training Practices in Disruptive Industries, a European Perspective. My name is Francesca Menduni, and I will co-moderate this webinar with my colleague, Vlad Miaescu. And uh, today I will shortly introduce uh, the Eden Network of Academic and Professions, which organized this webinar. I will then leave the floor to the uh, four speakers that will have uh, approximately 35 or 40 minutes to present the results of their research. And at the end, we will have a session of question and answer. You can actually start to um, discuss uh, within the chat. And if you want uh, to make some questions to the presenter, I suggest you to use the question and answer tool of Zoom. Uh, the Network of Academic and Professional of the Eden Association has three missions to support networking between uh, among uh, 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 people that are interested in the activity of the Eden Association, to support professional collaboration among individuals, and to support also knowledge sharing. How we do it? We do it uh, by organizing uh, the Eden Up webinars like this one that you are attending. We also organize Eden Chats on Twitter. We organize uh, activities during the uh, Eden conferences and uh, uh, many other kinds of activities. Uh, this is uh, the, the team of our Eden Up Steering Committee. Usually all the webinars are organized by one or two of us. And this is the reason why today I will be with Vlad, that is, he is also the chair of the Eden Up uh, Steering Committee. But uh, I don't uh, take uh, too much time for the presentation. And now I'm, uh, I will be very glad to present uh, our four uh, speakers. We promised an European perspective. And as you can see, we have uh, presenters from Finland, from Anc, from Italy, uh, from, and from uh, Switzerland, from the Swiss Federal University for Vocational Education and Training. In this slide, you can see also the order of our presenters. Uh, Dr. Essi Rimin will start by introducing the project on uh, which uh, this team is working on. Then Paolo Nardi will present the results, the general results of the different countries' perspective. And he will start also speaking about case studies and insights from the Italian context. Then Katia will speak about the results in the context of Finnish companies. And uh, at the end, we will show a five minutes video from uh, Alberto that will describe the results um, collected in the Swiss context. Now I will give the floor to Essie. Okay, good evening all. My name is Essi Ryymin and I come from Hame University of Applied Sciences, Finland. 
And I'm very sorry about the contrasts of light and shadows in my video stream. Hopefully you can hear my voice very well. So um, I will start our presentation by introducing our project, Still Learning. So Still Learning project is uh, innovative training solutions for learning at work in disruptive industries. And it's a two-year research and development initiative funded by the European Union Erasmus Plus program. The aim of the project is to investigate competence requirements and learning at work in new generating and transforming industries and develop innovative methods for continuous competence development. And the project partner organizations are Hame University of Applied Sciences from Finland, BNW from Germany, Cometa Formazione from Italy, and Swiss Federal Institute for Vocational Education and Training from Switzerland. And the disruptive industries engaged in the project are bioeconomy from Finland, automotive from Germany, tourism from Italy and Switzerland, and building from Switzerland. And Still Learning Project is divided in three phases, three intellectual outputs. The first output is analysis of competence requirements and learning at work in disruptive industries. And the second output is co-created idea bank of innovative learning and training solutions. And the third um, intellectual output, the third phase is hyper video based CMOOC, which means collaborative massive open online course, competence developer of a digital age. And our goal is to build the learning ecosystem between researchers educational institutions and industries during the project and pay attention to desired impacts and follow up. But now I will pass the turn to my colleague, Paolo Nardi. Thank you very much, Essie. Thank you, Francesca and Vlad for giving us this opportunity to share some of the emerging results of our project. I'm going to share the screen. Let me know if it doesn't work. Okay. Perfect. So actually, uh, as you may see, uh, it's up to me to present some insights from uh, the stakeholders that we have involved, stakeholders from these disruptive industries. I'm going to, to give you uh, an overview, but of course, it's uh, a collective work uh, involving all the partners of this project and all the people here uh, involved in this webinar as speakers. Of course, just a quick introduction about the framework. I think that in particular, in this context, uh, um, it's quite clear to everybody that we are living an era of disruption, where this idea of disruption is related not just to innovation, but to innovation happening very, very fast and with an incredible level of acceleration. And this exponential rate of change is something affecting, of course, the technical systems, the 
production processes, for instance, as well as the social and economical processes, the way people live, the way people behave, their consumptions, or just to give you another example, demography. So as the World Economic Forum in the last report on the future of jobs uh, 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 highlighted, of course, this disrupt disruptive era has a massive impact on the work, on work, on industries, and as a consequence, on education. Not only uh, thinking uh, of the future employees, but also the current employees in terms of reskilling and upskilling. Uh, it's, uh, I think, quite interesting from the, uh, the image uh, uh, we have in this slide that when education is not coordinated with the development in technology, we experience social pain. Vice versa, we experience prosperity. So it's quite relevant for all of us, and in particular in the context uh, of this webinar, to understand what is going to be the impact of disruption and in particular how, from an educational point of view, we can work on this. So actually the leading research questions which moved our project and moved our research have been uh, very, very simple, but clear. First of all, as we are experiencing a disruption, what are the most relevant key competencies, both uh, generic and transversal and field specific for the industries involved in this disruption? What are the factors uh, which support or inhibit uh, learning for current employees? And what are, if any, the current methods or practices experienced in the companies uh, to reskill, to upskill, or to facilitate learning? And in particular, uh, to what extent digital technologies are involved. In order to develop our research, uh, we focused on a, a quite clear scientific background. You see here a um, picture from Hillary's studies, so where actually learning is, of course, based on individual dimensions and community social dimensions and it's of course related from the individual perspective on the content which can be interactive active constructive reflective uh, as well as on incentives what's the motivation at individual level to pursue um, uh, learning at the same time from a community or social point of view of course, learning depends on the workplace production, so the workload, the division of labor, as well as the uh, interaction among colleagues, the interaction with supervisors. And of course, uh, we, we may say that the learning process depends on the interaction between these two levels, individual and social, and is of course related with uh, categories like the occupational self-efficacy, the learning personal approaches, and so on and so forth. So actually, based on this scientific background and on these different dimensions uh, affecting learning, we decided to develop a quantitative and qualitative analysis of stakeholders' views Stakeholders, we mean company staff, managers, employees in the in involved industries, as well as adult educators. And these analyses were developed on data collected by three main tools at national level. Interviews with employees, adult educators and managers, a questionnaire, an online survey for employees, and a Delphi uh, interview with managers. 
for this webinar, we are going to focus on the interviews with employees, adults, educators, and managers, uh, trying to give you some emerging results at national level and cross-national. The structure of the interview based on the scientific background I was sharing before uh, is quite uh, clear. Four main topics for a total of uh, more or less 10 questions, the, the, which are the disruption that they see happening or happened in the recent past. And based on this disruption, what are the skills, current and future skills, they need in their company, as an individual, as a company? What are the factors supporting or inhibiting learning at work? And what are the training practices that companies introduce in their context, in terms of methods, in terms of tools, and of course, what what, what's the digital dimension of these training practices? As you may see, the sample includes 63 people. It's quite uh, homogeneous uh, as a sample in terms of role of the people, gender, age, sectors, as Essie was mentioning, include tourism, textile, bioeconomy, above all, but also automotive building sector. And all uh, the countries involved in the project were, of course, involved, Switzerland, Finland, Italy, and Germany. The analysis was, was a qualitative content analysis uh, for the interviews. We uh, analyzed them at national level, and then all the results were shared to have a cross-national analysis, a system of coding based on unities of, me of meaning was created. And through several meetings among the partners, we tried to coordinate both the unities of meaning to be, to be used and also how to use them in order to have uh, national approaches, but a cross-national uh, system model. Results that I'm going to introduce you soon uh, present the percentage frequency of the codes categories or the marginal percentage frequency of the codes cate categories for each mode of the variable of interest for comparison. So in terms of sectors, in terms of nations, countries, in terms of roles. Now, uh, straight to the results. In terms of disruptions perceived, digitalization, of course, is the, the most frequent. But it's interesting to, uh, to, to see also these customers, suppliers' needs, which is something, by the way, we, we didn't include in the first version of our analysis, but was so clear from the first interviews that we decided to include it as a unity of meaning. What are the competencies? Uh, looking at transversal competencies, collaboration and teamwork is clearly recognized by most of the people as relevant for the future, as well as life skills, but also active learning. Uh, um, people need to develop a kind of growth mindset to be able to face, to cope with uh, a current and future disruption. As well as for digital competencies, of course, using digital equipment is the most frequent and it's uh, also because of COVID something um, uh, essential now. In terms of training approaches, uh, it's quite interesting. Uh, Traditional learning and reflection on practice are the most frequent, which means that in terms of our project and probably in terms of your community at Eden, uh, we need to develop something. We need to, to do something to make learning more innovative. And as you may see, digital technologies are mentioned, but mainly for communication or productivity. 
most, most innovative technologies are not quite frequent, at least in our sample. In terms of factors supporting uh, learning on the left, you may see that social interaction, connection, uh, it's also mentioned connectivity, uh, is very, very relevant as an organizational factor. At individual level, of course, uh, learning strategy at work or motivation are crucial. In terms of um, uh, factors inhibiting a learning workload is uh, the, the most frequent, and it's mentioned very, very often, as well as the lack of social interaction. In a nutshell, just to summarize, in terms of challenges, what our sample outline, that digitalization is clearly a disruption, a source of disruption, but also the changes in the needs and habits of the customers uh, is an important innovation, a source of disruption for their work. Uh, maybe at national level, we can also uh, give example on that. In terms of competencies, transversal skills, and we mentioned teamwork, life skills, active learning, are recognized as crucial. And it's interesting because it's quite in line with, for instance, the, the Future of Jobs uh, 2020 report uh, published a few months ago. Uh, finally, a kind of old-fashioned approach in terms of awareness of employees and in terms of methods uh, is emerging from the interview. So it's really a challenge for all of us to make more spread and to develop advanced solutions uh, in concrete experience uh, of uh, the companies involved. Uh, in the slides, you can also find some essential references, and of course, the reports will be soon. The report will be soon ready. Uh, now, if uh, Francesca and Vlad agree. I would continue, keep going with a, uh, an overview on the Italian case. So main feedbacks emerging from interviews in Italy. We'll be quite uh, fast on that. Just uh, important to mention that the Italian partner of the project is the Cometa Vet Center, which is a vocational training center providing courses in textile, carpentry, and tourism to more than 450 learners at EQF three and four levels, so um, high school. But we involved in this task also an associate partner, the International Academy of Tourism and Hospitality, uh, providing uh, EQF five uh, level courses to more or less uh, 200 learners but which is very interesting because uh, tourism companies uh, in the Lake Como area, where both Yacht and Cometa are based, uh, companies are directly involved in both the governance and the training provision. So stakeholders involved in the inter interviews, 15 interviews, two sectors involved, textile and tourism, managers, adult, adult educators, and employees in uh, as categories, uh, more or less, well, not more or less, but uh, in terms of average, they have a 20 year work experience behind, although we have very, very young people and also people with a lot of experience. Duration of the interviews was between 30 and uh, 30 minutes and one hour, but uh, in general was 45 minutes. It's interesting that the work was so interesting that we are still going on with the interviews because our partner, the International Academy, is very, very positive on that. So we are also doing other interviews. Main results. In terms of perception of disruption, 
again, confirming general results, digitalization, but also globalization, in particular in the textile sector. Uh, to give you an example, uh, the use of social is changing the way people work. Uh, if you make a mistake in your hotel, maybe your name and the name of your hotel can be spread through TripAdvisor in a few minutes. This is something changing the attitude of employees, as, just as an example, as well as customer needs and habits. Uh, uh, people mentioned the dimension of sustainability, for instance, as well as, to give you another example, the introduction of vegan or vegetarian menus in the hotels and restaurants is not just an exception anymore. It's a concrete part of the activity of a restaurant or hotel now. In terms of skills, digital skills are considered not just a plus, it's the basic, what you need to enter the market, as well as in terms of transversal skills, to be multitasking, as well as analytical thinking are crucial. In the era of big data, they need people able to understand what the data say. Learning factors. Uh, supporting learning collaboration, not only internal among colleagues or with the, the supervisor, but also external with the suppliers or with the customers. They are sources of learning. Uh, inhibiting learning factors, workload, but also the combination between learning opportunities, the timing of learning opportunities and the working time. Sometimes it's impossible to attend uh, learning opportunities. Finally, workplace learning, um, how it happens. It's very interesting what emerged in Italy. Results are very differentiated. In terms of big companies, mainly tourists, there is a great investment in training opportunities, mainly digitally based. There, there are platforms with an, an international perspective where you select what you want to learn in collaboration with your supervisor or colleagues, uh, and in order to improve yourself, reskilling, upskilling. Uh, when it comes to small and medium enterprises, it's a bit different. There is less effort in promoting formal learning opportunities, and usually they use traditional methods when they use them, or just coaching or learning on the job. You stay with your colleagues, your league and you learn. So it's more related to personal, personal initiative. And there is also an interesting gap between generations. The younger ones are more open-minded and invest a lot in learning and they want to learn while older generations, but not managers, uh, rather employees, have a, mm, let's say, a more fixed mindset and they are guided by a more extrinsic motivation. I need to do that because it's my job. I need to keep my job. Thank you very much. This is what uh, is emerging at uh, general level and at Italian level. And of course, thanks to all the colleagues uh, from the European partners and also from my organization and the YACT. Thank you very much. Thank you, Paolo. And now, Kate, it's your turn to present insights from Finnish cases. Yes, thank you so much. I will shortly share my screen here. So, hello, everyone. My name is Katja Maetoloa. I'm from Hame University of Applied Sciences. And thank you for this opportunity to present the emerging results of the Finnish context on behalf of our team. So, uh, Case Finland focused on a large-scale bioeconomy company, and we interviewed employees for qualitative data. Uh, the approximate uh, was 30 minutes per interview. All interviews were conducted online due to COVID, and uh, the interviews helped us to recognize the meaningful competences and learning methods at work. We 
particularly looked at the changes in the industry and work, uh, skills and learning processes, as well as future insights. So all together in our Finnish context, we had 13 interviews involving account managers, product managers and supervisors. And in addition, we did mapping of the ideas uh, with the management team of the same company, where management board members uh, brought in their visions and considerations of the strategic skills. So in the phase one, we had a short survey on competencies and learning resources and support. And on phase two, uh, we had a short ranking survey on the most important skills, practices, and resources. And this survey was based on the results uh, in the phase one. And in addition, we organized a workshop uh, which focused on joint work towards the strategic development of skills and competencies. So just some key findings that uh, we gathered from, the, from this work is first of all, looking at the changes in the field, how the market and customers are changing, uh, particularly in the bioeconomy sector, the number of primary producers is uh, uh, diminishing and there is a trend of more large farms and which also affects that farmers have more and more knowledge on different areas. The digitalization is present um, in IT, IT overall in this field, but also in the data systems that employees are using in their everyday working life. Uh, changes in the operating environment came through very clearly. The effects of globalization, uh, increased competition, and somehow also insecurity in, in this sector. Uh, changes in the field of commerce, e-commerce and its effects on the work. Uh, sustainability was something that we thought that would come through uh, even stronger, but it seems from, from this data that we collected that it is not given, but it requires pioneering work and, and it is also a very big, big image factor for, for this organization, for this company. And um, there were a lot of changes in the organization and in how the work is organized, uh, obviously due to COVID, but also otherwise uh, there was growing distant trend of distance work, flexibility, faster working rhythm, uh, need to be more effective with less resources, etc. And due to COVID pandemic, uh, the live meetings and events with customers were not present at all. So there was less this kind of discussion possibilities or, or possibilities to generate ideas with the colleagues. So just to look at the side of the learning and competence development, uh, first looking at the formal learning opportunities, there are these online uh, platforms which are in use. But one of the things that was was pointed out is that these platforms actually lack companies' own training materials. Uh, individual uh, learning preferences in relation to individual or collaborative learning and digital tools vary a lot. Um, on, the one, on one hand, the training online is very flexible to organize and people can advance in training at their own pace. Uh, but on the other hand, at the moment, um, it lacks a social dimension and, and this kind of possibilities to concentrate on what you are learning. Uh, the current training is mostly lecture type of training and very, uh, only very few other interactive tools are used. And uh, due to COVID pandemic, the number of trainings organized is actually a lot lower. Uh, sometimes the use of diffi difficult language can also create barriers for, to attend to training. And opportunities and encouragement to participate 
uh, in education is often linked to qualifications that you can achieve through the through attending to training. And to look at shortly more informal learning, learning by doing, uh, this was perceived often to link with the new tasks and new responsibilities when you have to learn something or um, searching, scanning information as there are, uh, there is large number of products and a lot of information is online. Um, this was also linked to the need to follow the development in the field, regulations or policy developments, or, or one's own reflection on the competencies and recognizing the new competencies needed at work. Collaborative and social and inter interactive learning activities also were, were present, in, especially in these interviews. And um, sharing experiences with colleagues or your own team uh, seemed to be a very important point uh, for learning. Uh, obtaining, obtaining performance feedback from a supervisor was recognized, also other more informal feedback from colleagues or customers, and uh, training opportunities uh, provided by different stakeholders, such as retailers, customers, or, or other shareholders um, that employees work in contact with and can provide this kind of specific uh, expertise in certain areas. So these are uh, shortly the emerging results from our Finnish context and just want to say thank you and I'll hand it over to Francesca who will continue with the Swiss results. Yes, I will. Uh, I will actually show a video from uh, Alberto that unfortunately cannot participate today. Okay. So, I turn off my own. Hi, nice to see you. I'm sorry not being able to be with you live today, but I'm happy to be anyway here in some way to present you result of our research units uh, on uh, still learning. And when I say our research unit, I mainly refer also to the very big contribution Francesca Mendoni gave to this kind of analysis. Today I will very briefly tell you about uh, the results in the three main sections of our research project, dealing especially with what happened with our sample in Ticino. Ticino is the Italian-speaking region of uh, Switzerland. In this region, we met uh, three kinds of uh, figures in three different uh, professional domains, which is uh, hospitality, building, and uh, textile companies. When it comes to asking them to narrate uh, their perception about uh, disruptions given by technologies in their domain, we can generally say that uh, at the first side, they speak about the same disruptions, but at the same time, they put a different emphasis depending on the professional context. So, if I think about the hospitality sector, one of the main disruptions refer to the past, and namely to the advent of booking online services. This created the need of new professional roles and competencies, and this is what is probably most important for us now and most interesting. An example is uh, the profile of the so-called revenue management, which needs to be able to make uh, data-driven decisions based on analytics provided by the booking platforms. In the hospitality sector, still, a future challenge is the higher and higher rate of automation that, uh, especially in this profession, is related uh, with uh, the receptionist and the reception uh, tasks. If we pass to the textile sector, we can report uh, two main uh, challenges they reported in, in our interviews. The first is the need uh, to find ways to combine e-commerce services and physical shops. And uh, we are describing this to the label Internet of Things. And the other one is uh, 
different kind of challenges that we can uh, group under the label uh, sustainability. Finally, if we refer to the building sector, big uh, B2B online services such as Alibaba are strongly shaping customers' and suppliers' expectations, both in terms of costs and service speeds. And this is what they perceive most as a, a technologically driven disruption. When it comes to skills and new profiles, we can briefly summarize two main points. The first uh, is probably more common and familiar to some of us on uh, how much more difficult it is to work on transversal skills than on technical skills. But what's probably more interesting to focus on now is um, the new profiles they focused on. In the textile sector, it seems that there is a need of a new figure able to correctly manage the communication between the headquarter and the physical shops. This new figure is something in the middle between the human resource manager and the digital marketing expert. And what's also interesting is that uh, from the interviews, emerged how difficult it is to find this kind of profile. When it comes to technology and constant learning practices, uh, the common point was the pandemics and what happened during the lockdown. So, first of all, we found a common trait for all of them, which is the role of blended learning in the future. So, they all agreed that blending learning is a form of harder training that will stay in the future and will continue to be explored. On the other side, what we noticed was uh, that some uh, forms of uh, non-formal learning, I'm thinking, for example, to a case uh, who spoke about a singing course uh, over the pandemic, online singing course. Okay, so in this case, some forms of, of non-formal learning uh, could change the attitude towards technologies of these people. So people who were a bit... Uh, a bit uh, resistant towards integrating technology for learning, they changed their opinion and their attitude. I hope in these few minutes uh, I could be as clear as possible. Again, I apologize for not being uh, with us with you today, but I'm sure that Francesca could answer all the questions you should have. Why? Perfect. So. I, I think that we can start our session of question and answer. The first question is for Paolo from Larisa. And the question say, thank you, Paolo, for your presentation. And there is a big challenge when it comes to work with older generation and transforming their extrinsic motivation into an intrinsic motivation. Are you doing something in that field? And of course, if uh, also the other presenters want to add something, they are uh, free to do it. So I will start with Paolo. Yeah, thank you, Francesca. Muchas gracias, Larissa. Uh, well, actually, I hope so that we are going to do something uh, with our partners in this project, because I think this should be part of our, uh, of our goals. Um, I have to say that in terms of reasons to explain that, what I've seen in, uh, in the people we interviewed is that uh, a lot of, um, let's say, the reason for that is often related to the company culture. As soon as uh, managers or leaders at company level promote a different attitude, a growth mindset, a different culture of errors and mistakes, soon we see a different attitude in the employees. Of course, with uh, uh, older people could be more difficult, but I think that we should work on the leadership level in order to start changing these attitudes towards the learning, these attitudes towards reskilling and upskilling. And of course, 
uh, in terms of also of the the the, the use of uh, more innovative learning solutions. But uh, I would leave also uh, my colleagues to 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 give ideas or answers. Thank you, Paolo. Um, Katia, Essie, would you like to jump in on this question, maybe? Uh, would you kindly repeat the question, please? Yes, sure. So the question was about the big challenge com uh, comes about older generations and transforming their extrinsic motivation into an in intrinsic motivation. And the question is, if you, are you doing something in this field in relation to, to this project? Yes, I could answer on, on behalf of our team. Actually, we are doing, as our organization is training organization, uh, um, we are very interested in, in finding uh, educational ways, uh, training methods, which uh, motivate different kind of learners. And we are actually collaborating with one um, steel metal industry uh, steel metal company currently where uh, they have very skilled very experienced um, welders and the challenge is to uh, transfer the know-how of these experienced experts to novice workers and uh, together we are developing methods where Older workers are collaborating with new coming, newcomers and they find it very motivating that they can share their experiences. Uh, someone is very interested in their excellent working methods, the practices they have created. And it's, of course, very beneficial for the newcomers too. So pairing up more experienced older workers with newcomers with a um, highly appreciating attitude seems to be quite quite nice way to work together. This is just one, one practical example. Thank you, Asi. There is another question uh, in, the, in the chat from uh, Aurimas. Uh, what is the most important finding for the, the organization and implementation of e-learning in your opinion? I don't know if Katia wants to start answering. Sorry, can you repeat the question again, please? Yes. Uh, what is the most important finding uh, important for organization and for the implementation of e-learning in the organization? I think that uh, from the interviews, and maybe Essie can add after me also, but from these interviews and data that we collected, uh, it just highlights the importance of informal learning and, and highlights the importance of uh, different kind of ways to learn in, in fle very flexibly in, in your work. And also maybe highlights the importance of recognizing that learning, that sometimes we might learn while we're working, but we don't really recognize that we are learning. If we recognize those moments, then maybe we can enhance their importance for whole of our work community. So uh, because it seemed, for example, with this bioeconomy company that they are organizing some formal trainings, but it seemed that they were less less effective compared to the informal uh, learning uh, as we discovered if, through this data. Essie, would you like to add something? Katja, I think that was a very good point. And um, I would like to add another issue. Uh, in our case study, we, we also found that uh, both employers and employees um, their attitude towards digital learning or digitally enhanced learning was quite positive, but in practice, they uh, didn't apply or implement innovative digital tools. So one could say that the field is ready for uh, digital innovations or to, to apply more digital technologies in learning. We just need to find out the ways and uh, find out the ways how to scale and, and disseminate these good, good methods we, we educators may know. But the attitude was positive. 
Um, Arim, Arim has asked the, if um, you have some examples on how to support uh, informal learning through digital technologies uh, or if something emerged. Maybe I can say something about the Swiss context. Uh, in uh, the textile company that we interviewed, uh, the general manager uh, told us that he was very interested in promoting uh, informal learning strategies at work. Work. And the company is uh, developing a project uh, on mo- the use of mo- mobile learning. Uh, and it was inspired by the TikTok application. I don't know if you have in mind, it's an application that now is very used among younger generation. And uh, they are using this mobile learning app to support learning in the physical shops. So to transfer knowledge from the headquarters to the physical shops. And they involve some young people that is able to create this kind of content that are very short, very easy to transmit. This is only an example of a good practice that we retrieved concerning a way to support informal learning strategies at work. I don't know if the others want to add some other examples or considerations. Maybe one uh, short uh, comment to add, uh, as we mentioned with the with the results that there is often in informal learning, there is this uh, learning from your colleague or getting more new information from different shareholders and learning through that. But often how it happens is that you learn something from your colleague that it becomes more your own quiet, <laughs> private knowledge. But I think that the digital tools uh, implied in this kind of working environment could also create more shared Uh, platforms where this knowledge would then be uh, shared with other co-workers and and become more shared knowledge instead of individual knowledge and competence. Maybe Francesca, if may I just um, go back to the original question about e-learning, because in the Italian context was quite interesting to see that e-learning is considered both a, well, either a success, a big success, or a failure. And it depends on how it is developed. So uh, your example on, uh, on the app, the mobile app and the informal learning made me think that when e-learning is just a different uh, setting, uh, an online setting for traditional frontal uh, training, uh, it's considered a failure, is not interesting, it's just something more to do for employees. On the other hand, it was amazing to listen to interviewees from some hotel chains uh, um, describing the great opportunities of learning from the platform developed by the the international chain which was marriott by the way uh, uh, where they have the opportunity to meet people from all over the world to uh, to watch and watch again some modules to be in touch and work together with other people and to brief uh, an international uh, dimension of development Uh, challenges uh, related to their sector. Thank you, Paolo. We have still five minutes, so there is another question for Esti. Uh, Larisa asked about uh, the, the MOOC, the uh, MOOC project, the collaborative MOOC. So if you tell uh, Larisa some more information about uh, the collaborative MOOC, so the project will develop. Yes, uh, during this this project, uh, the MOOC will be quite compact uh, experiment. So it's not uh, totally open for everybody, but it's open for the target group, which is going to both test and evaluate and also um, evaluate its um, pedagogical usability. 
and this why why it is C MOOC, what does this tiny C letter mean here? Collaborative MOOC. It means that um it's uh it it's um facilitated by teachers or tutors. So when you are an attendant in the MOOC, you are not doing it. Uh, you are not completing it uh, totally um, individually, but you are receiving guidance and support from tutors and teachers, and you will work in in a collaborative way uh, within your small uh, small group study group. But we are eager to test this CMO together with our industry partners. And we are eager to share there the good pedagogical practices, how to strengthen informal learning at work. So it's going to be a tiny pedagogical experiment. And if we get good results from this experiment, we we will consider the further implications. Thank you, Assi. Uh, the CMOOC sounds really interesting. Will you be publishing the outcomes at a later date? Ask in the chat. Uh, excuse me, was it about uh, publishing the results? Yeah, or? yes, publishing the results, yes, of the CMOOC project. Yeah, the results of CMO project will be published in um, next autumn term, I think, in, in August or September 22. Yes. Perfect. I think it could be uh, important <laughs> now that we have a question also to mention that we have uh, a LinkedIn group where if you are anybody is interested in um, following the development of the project, you may find their ideas and uh, outputs that uh, we are developing and going publishing uh, step by step learning thank you paolo um there is another uh, last question we have two minutes still um does the mooc consider interdisciplinary work within the teams Oh, yes. Thank you for this question. This is essential part of CMOOC that we will create uh, interdisciplinary or, or multidisciplinary study groups so that the industries can even learn from each other and people from different companies and from different educational institutions can learn from each other. And this is also the way how they, as uh, competence developers, can use uh, informal learning resources as their learning catalysts, but they also get lots of ideas how to support their colleagues, their employees to find more learning resources. Thank you. Thank you, Essie, so much. So the time for our webinar is finished. Thank you so much for participating. Uh, I'm sending now in the chat a questionnaire for assessing uh, th this webinar, for providing us feedback uh, for the next webinars, uh, suggestions to improve it. And uh, I wish to thank the, all the presenters and uh, uh, Vlad for supporting me in the co-hosting of this webinar. So um, you, you should know that we organize webinars uh, the, the first Wednesday of each month. So we will announce soon the next webinar of the Eden Up uh, series. Thank you so much for participating and see you soon. Bye.